Hello, welcome to another episode of Tuesday Morning Left Guard. Matthew Collar, along with former Minnesota Vikings offensive lineman Jeremiah Searles. And this is your day, buddy. This is your day because <laughs> of all the days that I have covered the Minnesota Vikings starting in the year 2016, game after game after game after game of walking out and being like, ooh, you know, some offensive line troubles there. This was an incredible performance by the Vikings against the San Francisco 49ers. Your thoughts about the offensive line dominating one of the best defensive lines in the league and having a terrific offensive performance. I, I still, it is a Tuesday morning, by the way. It is 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. And the fact that we watched that game last night, and I think I texted you, after, I was like, what is happening? Like, I feel like my eyes are lying to me because this was the juggernaut of the San Francisco 49ers D-line that we have watched run up and down the field on every team that they played for, except for Cleveland last week, but they even got after him a little bit. And they walked into U.S. Bank, and there was a wall in front of Kirk Cousins last night. And it didn't matter. Everyone was playing great. Dalton Reisner, I thought, played really well for his first start. I mean, Darisaw solidifying why he is the best left tackle in the NFL right now with Andrew Thomas and Trent Williams being sidelined. If you had to pick someone tomorrow to start at left tackle for your team, it would be Christian Darisaw. And you can arguably say the same thing about Brian O'Neill on the right side. You know, Lane Johnson's playing okay this year. I think he's battling through some injuries, but I'm looking around the league and I watched a ton of football on Sunday. It was great just to kind of sit and relax and I have to watch the Vikings and panic. And to just look around the league play and go, man, we are so lucky. Lucky to have these two offensive tackles. And it goes back to what we talked about last week of we're too talented to be this bad, right? And so up front, to, to hold that team to no sacks, to have Bosa win one out of the 40 pass rushes he had against Christian Derrissaw is just an incredible feat. And I know last week we were saying burn it all down, and I'm not sure I'm ready to say we're cold, we're totally back and ready to go. But you can build off a performance like that. And offensive line play is so much built around confidence and just knowing you can do it. And when you have a group that goes out and does that against a juggernaut defensive line like that, that group builds a lot of confidence. And maybe Dalton Reisner was the linchpin that we needed to just pop on in there for $4 million and say, we fixed it. Or maybe they've actually been good all season long, but they have not faced quite a test like this. And th they also haven't taken advantage of it. And sometimes, even in last night's game, they took advantage of it in the run game, which was the first time we had seen that since uh, just some plays against the Los Angeles Chargers. But they were ripping off some big gains at times with Alexander Madison and Cam Akers, who probably needs to see the field a little bit more. And Kirk Cousins had time to throw. I, I saw somebody on the San Francisco side tweeting out that Cousins about 2.7 uh, seconds from snap to throw was one of the slowest times of any quarterback that has gone against San Francisco because normally all these teams game plans are try to get the ball out quick, try to get the ball quick. And what you saw from San Francisco was all sorts of single high safety stuff, loading up the box, playing that aggressive type of, the, of football that they do. But when it doesn't get home, there's just people running wide open and there's TJ Hawkinson who, you know, so maybe we owe some apologies to, I mean, I, I, but the thing with TJ Hawkinson is he always is there to catch the ball when he can get open and make plays with it. It's the idea that you're asking him to be like Randy Moss sometimes that he usually can't bring those in. And if you're going to play a single high safety, then Hawkinson can get separation. He can find holes and make plays. And that's exactly what happened. I think that, yeah, I mean, San Francisco came in with their typical sort of, we're going to be the 49ers. We're just going to play our style of defense. And these two tackles, gave them the Matumbo finger wag. You're not going to let your defensive <laughs> MVP beat us. And the fact that it's him, it's like they were missing some players on the offensive side, but they weren't missing anybody on the defensive side. The fact that it's him to go along with Hargrave, Armstead. I mean, these guys are, are monsters and put on that performance. I mean, that is the type of offensive line performance that boosts and elevates everything you can do on offense. Yeah, and it wasn't just the passing game or the run game. We got the screen game going a little bit. You know, early in the game, we got the screen game going, and that slows down a pass rush like you wouldn't believe. 
you wouldn't believe what that does. Just hitting on one or two screens just puts it in the back of those defensive ends, those D tackles minds of, am I beating them too fast? Am I up the field too quick? And by then the ball's out, right? You just need to slow them down just a half a step or even a full step to let them think, is this screen or not? And I thought KOC did a great job of sprinkling in those screens early on and not just in third and long situations. Right, a first and ten, a second and eight, somewhere in there where it's not an obvious screen, right? So many times, like you hear the commentators all the time, well, third and long here, look for screen or draw, right? Like we sprinkled them in when they were probably expecting a drop back or they were expecting a run play. So they didn't have a man to man defense on where those linebackers can blow those screens up early. And a nice job of the offensive lineman getting out in space and covering guys up. And I mean, just a complimentary offense last night from knowing when to win, run the football, the screen game, and then also taking advantage of the one-on-one coverage. And, man, how lucky are we to have to have Addison? I mean, we are so lucky to have a guy like that where when you lose your all-world receiver, you have a guy that just says, we talk about who's going to step up to the bell. He stepped up to the bell in a big way. And we also said everyone else needs to step up. Powell stepped up in a big way and came up with some huge catches. Hawkinson stepped up. Everyone is sharing the load for the loss of Justin Jefferson. And it, maybe it took the the close game to the Bears and the poor performance by the Bears for everyone to realize, I have to step my game up. I have to be better or else we are going to really, really struggle on offense. And you saw everyone take a step forward last night with the ability to show, hey, we're all still NFL players. We all still make a lot of money. We can earn our rights too. I think what this showed last night is what they can be as an offense. Mm. We also can't forget going two for 13 on third down just one week ago. And also Matt Eberflus did a great job of forcing Kirk cousins to go underneath and not giving up anything, you know, deep and over the top, or even like intermediate where they were just clogging those areas, playing a lot of quarters and things like that. And then, you know, San Francisco comes out with their style because I always think like styles make fights in the NFL where it's like, if, if you're not going to do the game plan week to week, where instead you're going to play your system, it does open you up to somebody gaming your system. The reason no one games San Francisco system is because Nick Bosa sacks them all the time and they usually stuff the run really well but that's if you can stop that that has always kind of been an answer to whether it was D'Amico Ryans whether it was Robert Sala but usually that answer is not available and that's to me is is what this shows is with an offensive line that's this good you can have the potential of putting up big numbers on a week-to-week basis and having the offense drive the success and now hey look Oh, the schedule. Oh, oh my gosh. That schedule looks pretty easy. I, but I, I don't know how much to react to this though, because I do think that things like Addison Hawkinson, the tackles, even Garrett Bradbury's improvement, which is carried over from last year. And now that he's healthy, he's playing extremely well. These should work week to week, but is it just a one-off where they threw the kitchen sink at them and then we're going to go back to exactly what we saw? That's why this week they have to prove it again. But I also thought this is the ceiling and the ceiling is very high when you have blocking that's that good. Folks, we are going all in on prize picks this football season. Every week we are playing and testing out our skills here on Purple Insider to see if we could predict what numbers players will put up every Sunday. If you haven't heard of it, trust me, you're going to want to check it out. Prize picks is the easiest and best way to play daily fantasy. Instead of battling against thousands of other players and people who spend their entire lives doing fantasy, all you do is pick more or less on between two and six player stat projections. So say a quarterback's number is 250.5 yards, go more or less and bang, you are playing and you can pick from hundreds of players and numbers this football season. The cool thing is that it's quick and and easy and does not cost an arm and a leg. You can turn $10 into 250 just like that. Again, the perfect way to fit it into a busy day, click, click, and you're playing. This isn't just something that I like. You're going to hear us doing every single week prize picks on the show on Purple Insider. So go to prizepicks.com slash purple and use the code purple for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash purple with the code purple. Daily fantasy sports made easy. 
Folks, want to remind you to make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. Order online during their Pizza Pizza pregame one hour before NFL games and get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or their in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the tastiest hour before kickoff. The ceiling's very high when you have talent this good. I mean, you just have too much good talent to to look around the field and say someone's going to be able to win at one point in this time. And, you know, I saw some uncharacteristic stuff from the Niners last night where I think Steve Wilkes, their their defensive coordinator, was panicking a little bit. You know, he was panicking where he's sending all-out pressure. I mean, engage eight, the old Madden, engage eight, and send the house. And, you know, we you don't want to do that when you're playing against guys like Justin Jefferson because he does things like Addison did last night, right? He goes up, he mosses a ball away from the receiver, and the only thing between him and the end zone is green grass. And you didn't, you saw that initially. You were like, okay, they're just going to send their four and get home. But when they weren't getting home, you saw pressure and more pressure and safety pressure and nickel pressure and linebacker pressure. And Kirk Cousins, to all his faults, is usually pretty good at being able to understand where the pressure is coming from and knowing where his one on one matchup is and giving his receiver a chance to go get the football. That's been something throughout his career. He's very smart. He's a smart guy, right? Even if he does take Tuesdays off, he's a smart guy. You know, he understands, hey, I did my film study. I know when a pressure package comes. If I can see even just an inkling of it in the pre snap read, I know where my number one read is. And he did that time and time again last night. And hats off to Madison. I thought he pass blocked really well last night. You know, for a guy that I think has struggled at times this year of stepping up, putting his nose in there and hitting a linebacker, I thought he identified some where these blitzes are coming from, stepped up there, didn't cut in the hole, which is a cardinal sin of a running back, in my opinion, and just died a slow death, but just gave that half a second left for Kirk Cousins to be able to go. And yes, this is the ceiling of what this team is, but I think we'd be remiss to think that this defense is going to be able to play this way week in and week out, too. You know, they geared up for a heavyweight fight against a heavyweight offense with McCaffrey and Ayuk. And I know they were missing Devo Samuel and Trent Williams, but you know, this defense geared up, but it goes back to, is this the defense that we saw against Philly that got it just jammed down their throats over and over again? Or is it the defense of the Niners? And we're at this crossroads as fans and as media here that goes, what team are we going to get every single week? Are we just going to ride the roller coaster and, hey, one week it's going to be the Bears that we played against the Bears, one week it's going to be against the the Niners, or are we going to start to see more of a consistent play as we go down the stretch here with the Vikings? And I don't think anyone can answer the answer, the yes or no to that question. Well, I think the answer with the Vikings is always that you're going to ride a roller coaster no matter what, <laughs> because I, that, that just tends to be who they are. And look, I mean, last night, uh, Greg Joseph misses a field goal and who isn't thinking it? And uh, last week, it's Tyson Bajan driving and who isn't thinking it? But in the first couple weeks, the one score games taketh away. And then in the last two weeks, the one score games giveth. And here we are again, sort of playing that game. But I want to talk about Jordan Addison more because uh, I remember, and and you talk about it sometimes about what we saw from Justin Jefferson early in his career. And I kept asking you, do you believe him now? Do you believe him now? Uh, With Jordan Addison, I was buying him in training camp. There are very few rookies that in training camp on the first couple of days in pads, mind you, are roasting NFL corners. And then, of course, you're going to be like, well, well, it's these Vikings corners, I guess. But it just doesn't <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And then the ability to make high difficulty catches to reach out and snatch the ball is something that, again, stood out immediately. You just don't see it that often. And what he did last night was a special type of play. I mean, you, you, you call it a mossing. We usually think of that as reaching over somebody, but just straight stealing the ball out of somebody's hands on a bomb down the field and then running it in for a touchdown. It's, it's what he did in college. It's what he did in training camp. He's doing it almost every single week now. And I don't know what it is about this franchise and drafting wide receivers or finding wide receivers, some undrafted who become superstars. But here we are again, and I I can't be more impressed with Jordan Addison through seven weeks. No, I'm completely with you. And, you know, it's such a relief 
I know Justin Jefferson sitting on the sideline and it's just eating him, but he's also watching the success as and goes, man, when I get back, just wait and see, right? Because you can't bracket coverage him. Now you want to bracket coverage him, sweet. You got another guy on the other side that's going to be able to go. And that was the hope of what Thielen was supposed to be last year, you know, and he's having a great year in Carolina. Hats off to Thielen. I think he's having a fantastic year out there. But, you know, everyone was hoping that was going to be the two-headed monster that it was early on when Jefferson got here, and it just wasn't last year. But with the addition of Addison, you have to pick your poison of who you want to be. And for me, it's also the yards after catch. You know, that's where Jefferson, that's where a lot of, I mean, Julio Jones and DeAndre Hopkins and all the great ones where they can make the congest- the contested catches, but what they do with the ball in their hands afterwards is what makes them elite. Right, being able to have the speed to separate at full speed, catch the ball and take it, or physical enough to wrestle away from an arm tackle of a corner that's falling down and get an extra ten or fifteen yards before the safety gets there. And his yards after catch this year have been really, really good. And that's because of separation he creates in the route, but also understanding the zone, the hole in the zones, knowing where to settle down, where to throttle down, where to speed up and get in that second window. His IQ for a rookie wide receiver is very, very high. And very excited for him and the future in which he has here uh, as a Viking in purple. There's a natural playmaker to him that reminded me of Stefan Diggs right away. And, and Stefan Diggs has 20 pounds on him. So there's a little more muscle to him than there is uh, Jordan Addison. And, and when he got out muscled for that ball in the first quarter, that was one of those where I saw. And it's funny because on, on Monday Night Football, everyone's watching the same game. So you see like Darius Butler, who is on the McAfee show before really good player in the NFL tweeting like, yep, that's getting out muscled by a veteran player. And so you kind of get these instant reactions actions and that is exactly what happened and then he took advantage the rest of the day of the 49ers trying to man him up with Charveris Ward who's a good player but it's not like Darrell Rivas out there what the 49ers were doing is saying we're going to see if this rookie can beat us and the answer is he can and it wasn't just that play which is the one that stands out but I mean he ends up with seven catches for 123 yards I mean it was a consistent effort from him he also was was cramping up down there at times came back in the game continued to fight through it made a couple of more uh catches that was a star number one receiver type performance for a guy that as you mentioned is going to be the number two wide receiver going forward and then there's there's just a part of me Jeremiah that keeps coming back to like wait this team is three and four this team that I just watched is three and four and I I don't like this is what we expected it to be the question is how can it keep being this way and certainly one thing that they have to do is finish some of these drives not having a single Mm -hmm. rushing touchdown all year bad not 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 good at all if you're at the two yard line and you can't just run the football into the end zone but like how does it carry over how do they get this to be consistent week in and week out because if it just happened in this game that's great and it was a fun night but it won't matter but with the talent they have it should happen on a week-to-week basis it has to happen on a week-to-week basis i think we the amount of what how many points we scored last night 27 22 right 22 is a good amount but that's not enough to win in this league a lot of the time right i'll look around the league and you have to be able to score more and if we run the football in there this is a 30 plus point victory right we have 30 plus points in this game if we can run the football into the end zone and that is the piece that is missing is this rushing attack and cam Akers is going to take the spot away from alexander madison i do believe that i think he's a more complete back when i watch him the way he has reads, the patience, and the way he hits the hole. I don't think he's quite as physical a runner as Madison is, but I think he's a better overall runner. And remembering that he just got here a few weeks ago, you know, he's still trying to figure out the trust of this offensive line, the timing of what this running game is, because it is slightly different than what L.A. was. And the more he can get comfortable and the more reps he can get, hopefully he can be that spark for us as that running the football into the end zone piece. But you get the run game going on this offense. And that is the one thing that's missing is the run game. You get that going on this offense. Then the defense is the one that's always on their heels, right? They can decide, Hey, like the bears did want to sit back and play coverage. Cool. You have two high safeties. We're going to run the football, right? But when we can't run the football effectively, it allows defenses to be able to dictate the pace of the game and allows defenses to dictate how they want to protect against Addison and Jefferson and Hawkinson because you're a one dimensional football team. And KOC even said it last night, in his post game, uh, when he's talking to the team, he's like, Kirk Cousins was hot, threw a lot of passes. 
It's like, yeah, that's that's great, but what happens when he's hot, but the coverage is cut there? It's just good. You have to have something to fall back to. And whether that's the pin-pull scheme, the inside zone scheme, whatever it may be, we have to find a bread-and-butter run scheme that fits this offensive line and fits Cam Akers in order to get this offense to the next level. One thing that they did do last night was control the game on the clock, which they have not done all year. And I'm not a huge time of possession freak because if you score on three plays, as San Francisco did on one of their drives, I'll take it. I'm good. That'll work for me. But one thing that has been noticeable is if you don't want Justin Jefferson or Jordan Addison to crush you is keeping them on the sideline. And that's what a lot of teams have done. That's how Chicago in, in some ways stayed in the game with longer drives. Definitely Carolina didn't finish them, but had that like bad teams have been able to stay in against the Vikings by keeping them off the field and getting those third down stops. And look, it's an old cliche to say that third and short is a lot easier, but it just is. It, it just is. Uh, I've got some questions on, on the offensive side. I want to talk about the defense. And then, of course, we got to get to big picture stuff, which, you know, uh, is uh, obvious as we approach the trade deadline. But Kevin O'Connell in the game management, if they lose this game and Greg Joseph misses his field goal and then Brock Purdy, instead of throwing it directly to the other team, it leads a game winning drive, which I just thought he got impatient there. I thought he had time mm -hmm. and could have, could have driven the ball down the field instead kind of freaked out and just like launched one. I, I didn't really understand that, but um, maybe that's just who he is when it comes to O'Connell's game management. We got two field goals inside the five yard line, which I thought was going to screw them and ultimately did not. Uh, the 50 yard field goal is a pretty risky play. Didn't really play aggressive in that area of the field. They kind of played for a field goal, which I thought was weird to do because it's a long field goal and Greg Joseph is not perfect. There are things still on a weekly basis where I'm kind of like, Oh, I, I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. Like it wasn't the timeouts this week, but it was the timeouts a couple of weeks ago. And maybe it's just something that you have to give and take with a play caller as your head coach. Like you get the benefits of him being your play caller, which clearly called a phenomenal game against the 49ers. But one thing that's just going to always be a little hard is some of the game management stuff. I, I guess I don't really know what to make of it. You know, I, I wonder if at times he questions himself with some of the game management stuff because I thought for sure, no doubt about it, because of what he's been for a long time, the aggressive nature, that fourth down there at the end of the game was like, oh, he's going for this. Like, why? Why He always goes for this. Why wouldn't he go for this? And then you kind of see him him and Han on the sideline. He's like, eh, we're not going to do it. And I don't know if that's him. It can go one ways. Maybe that's him growing as a head coach and understanding, hey, analytics are great, but my defense is playing really well right now. Right, Right now in this game, I have a lot of trust in Brian Flores and what this defense is doing. Let's trust them, right? And instead of just, oh, what the numbers say, analytics, I should just be aggressive and do this. You know, I think there's some growth there and some trust that's building there between Flores and, and him of understanding, hey, if you guys are hot, I'll trust you, right? If you're not, maybe I got to be aggressive and push the envelope here and do our things. And same thing with the, the field goals, right? Knowing that points are probably going to be a premium in this in this game. We walked into this game probably going, hey, if we can get three, we got to take it, right? We got to take it because we don't know if we're going to get back down there with this great defense. And when are they going to finally turn the light bulb on and start clicking and making plays and getting that turnover that they need to have at that need to have moment like they've done all year. And he played more of a conservative game last night, but I'm betting that was the plan going into the game. You know, betting that that was what he wanted to do and trust in the defense and doing all that. But I don't know if it's questioning himself or if it's growth as a head coach or whatever it may be. But I think I would rather see the aggressive KOC personally. Personally, I would like to see the go for the kill. That's my mentality. That's what I'm instilling in this team as their mentality, as we're a go for the kill, no holds back. Let's just lay everything on the line type of a head coach type of decision making that I make. I want to see more of that KOC than the conservative KOC we saw last night. And you're talking about the punt after the the third and fourth throw down third the side. Third and four. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, the bunch left, and they threw a, a, a back shoulder fade to KJ Osborne on the third and four, which I thought was a questionable decision by Kirk. But, uh, again, the tape's not up yet. I haven't got a chance to look at the bunch and saw if Hawkinson or someone came over on a slant or whatever for an easy pitch and catch. 
but I would have liked to see him go for it there or run it to set yourself up in a fourth and one or a fourth and short to go for it on fourth down. We've just seen that too many times to think that it's just Kirk on those like long throws on third and short. And, and but if he goes for the kill on third and four and then goes for it on fourth down, then I'm totally fine with it. Like, all right, take a shot on third mm-hmm. and four because yeah, you're going for it. Go ahead. I, I'm OK with that. But then to punt, I was like, I don't really understand this. And I totally get you with. Okay, yeah, Brian Flores' defense is playing pretty well. Purdy was moving the ball throughout the game. He was averaging over nine yards of pass attempt. It was more his mistakes and the fumble by Christian McCaffrey than it was that they like were being totally stifled. And the kicker helped by missing a 40-yard field goal. Um, good idea to spend a draft pick, a high draft pick. <laughs> On a kicker, San Francisco. Um, yes, I guess you can overcome some bad draft picks. Who knew? Did you did you um, did you mm. see them showing pregame where he was falling down? Did they did they show that it's like no. during the game? They're like well, after he missed the field goal, they would flash back to pregame because every up commentator known to man loves talking about like, well, from the, before the game, he was good from and he was like kicking the ball and he like fell down as he kicked it. And they were like, Oh, maybe, maybe he's hurt. Maybe like just trying to throw anything at the walls. He was, I was like, he just missed. He just, he just missed. Like, let's not make more of this than it is. He just pushed it a little to the right because he yeah. might not be that good of a kicker, even though they drafted him <laughs> would not be the first time. Uh, Roberto Aguayo, uh, the, the most famous uh, high draft pick kicker. second round. The, what I, the point I was going to make is just that. Okay. I feel you when you're talking about making those fourth down decisions based on what you're seeing. And I think it's okay occasionally to go against what the numbers would tell you in that position. But if you go against them too much, then you're just going against the numbers. You're not making it by your feel at the two to three yard line. Sure. You probably are lacking confidence at that point. After you've seen them bungle a couple of plays, you really need a touchdown. And you should have needed a touchdown to beat the 49ers. I mean, uh, the plays were made on defense. They botched some things. They botched some third downs. Uh, they botched the, you know, one opportunity where they missed that field goal. Most of the time, if you're playing a good team, you have to score a touchdown. Most of the time you have to finish that third and four off because you don't expect the other quarterback to just throw it right to Cam Bynum for some reason, which I still don't fully understand. And if you're on the San Francisco side this morning, you're saying we gave that game away in so many ways. You want to say we finished that game, not they had to give it away by throwing two interceptions to end up losing. And that's where I would like to see Kevin O'Connell particularly when you have good blocking. If if you think that you're just going to get your quarterback killed, all right, fine. But that's not what's going on. They, they need to be more aggressive with some of this stuff, I think, as they go forward or they're going to regret it. Now, on the other side, uh, Brian Flores, I think, has transformed a defense that was just painful to watch last year. And he talk about throwing the kitchen sink. There's 17 different defensive players running out on the field last night. If you are on the roster, you played in that football game against the 49ers. We're seeing Andrew Booth. We're seeing Kyrus Tonga. We're seeing him use the 49ers to be like, who the hell are these people? And all sorts of different looks, all sorts of different rushes, all sorts of different coverages. And the fact that they can handle them with young players to me says well coached and his impact all season long in my mind has been very significant. Yeah. And the thing I love about Flores is I'm going to make a comparison to my, to my Huskers here. You know, he came in here, the Huskers defense, was bad, bad, bad last year, but we have Tony white who came in from Syracuse and Flores, a kind of similar situation. They came in. They're like, this is the roster. These are the players we got. We got to make something happen with it. And Flores is tailoring his defense to his players. He's not square peg round holing. Like this is my system. We run it this way. If you're a rush end, I'm putting you with your hand in the dirt and you're playing three technique, right? He's not making guys do things that they don't want to do, or they're not going to be great at. He's knowing his personnel and knowing his players, knowing what they excel at individually, and then tailoring the scheme around them. And that is the sign of a phenomenal coach, not a good coach, a phenomenal coach. When you can say, okay, I'll put my pride away. I'll put what I say and what I stamp of like the Flores system, 
right? And we're going to be able to tailor it and move it and tweak it here and there so that it really becomes the Viking system about the 11 players that are on this defense at any given time. And he's creating chaos a little bit. You know, you're seeing maybe Purdy is seeing ghosts. We we call it seeing ghosts. When you play that many guys and you send that many different pressures and you play that many different coverages, a quarterback can easily start seeing ghosts and thinking it's single high and then it's double high or it's going to be cover two and then all of a sudden it's cover three or, okay, this is a zone read. Oh, crap, they're in man, right? Like those type of things can start to rattle a quarterback, not just physically, right? Everyone talks about quarterbacks getting rattled when they're getting beat up. Like, oh, man, he's rattled back there. But I think Purdy, who is still a young quarterback, right, is all the success that he's had. He still has a rookie season that he didn't play all of last year. You know, he's still, in my mind, kind of getting into that rookie box a little bit. He mentally rattled him a little bit last night, which is why we talk about why did he throw it to Andrew Booth or why did he throw it to Bynum? I don't know. Maybe he was rattled. Maybe he thought it was a different coverage than it really was. And that just goes back to, I mean, what he's done. He's going to be a candidate for a head coach somewhere next year. I just, he's done too good of a job for me to think that he isn't, but very lucky that we have him and really excited for what he's done and how he's invigorated this Vikings defense over this year. And that's a complicated discussion that we have too much to get to, to go all the way down that rabbit hole. But <laughs> let's just suppose that the uh, NFL owners have blackballed him just enough for the Vikings to benefit. <laughs> you can really build on something here with Flores. There are players who are historically not all that impressive, who have been good for this team so far. I'm thinking of someone like Jonathan Bullard, for example, who's kind of a journeyman defensive tackle, was just a guy on their team uh, last year, and now he's playing a big role against the run. Christian McCaffrey did not run over them, and that was really the key. If Christian McCaffrey was going to run over them, they would control the whole game, uh, but they forced Brock Purdy to beat them, and sometimes he did, and sometimes he threw them the ball, but we've seen a Caleb Evans playing well, Andrew Booth Jr. is on the field, which is why we don't declare people draft busts after their rookie season because he's been healthy and now he's worked his way uh, back into the rotation at cornerback. An undrafted free agent is here making plays in Ivan Pace Jr. and Cam Bynum, who I know frustrated you at times last year. And yet this year we've seen him play more aggressively. He's, he's had more tackles where he's flying up to the line of scrimmage and making plays. And then he's in position to make a lot of plays in coverage where last year I thought the guy was playing at the goal line. And if you threw it anywhere in front of him, it would be fine. And yet this just shows you, I think, one of the most valuable positions in all of football is that defense coordinator. 100%. Yeah, and you look at the really successful teams in the league, they all have very, very good defensive coordinators. It's why the Niners, I had to look up again who their defensive coordinator was because it seems like every year they're like, head coach, head coach, head coach, right? Because those guys are worth their weight in gold with the way that the league is going with an offensive juggernaut and you're paying your quarterbacks $270 million because they can throw it all over the yard. The league is scrambling to find ways to slow those guys down. How do we slow these high-powered offenses down? Because when we get into the playoffs, we want to make a Super Bowl run. We're going to run into one of these guys. It's just the nature of the beast. We're going to run into one of these superstar quarterbacks. Well, hey, D coordinator, what are you doing to scheme this guy to slow him down? Because we have the players. We'll try and get to them. But if we can't slow them down by coverage or scheme or pressure, then they're just going to rip us apart. And so, yeah, do I hope that he's not a head coach next year? Selfishly as a Vikings fan? Yeah, for sure. But I think that he's earning the right to possibly get a chance to if all the nonsense behind the scenes can slowly go away. But, man, he has been such a, a, a find for KOC, and we got lucky. We got lucky that he was out there for us. Let me ask you this question, and this comes only hours after the Vikings' best win in a very long time. I, I mean, Buffalo last year, but this was a more – complete win you outplay the other mm -hmm. team not the opposing quarterback had to fumble or somebody had to do something crazy and get lucky or anything this was you played better than them at football for an entire game and they're supposed to be you know a super bowl team um how high do you want to get on this win how much are you snorting this win how many wins do you think this team ends up finishing with right now I can't let myself get too high because it's just too inconsistent. It's too inconsistent. You know, you have to be a consistent football team to be a good football team in this league. 
I mean, look at what happened to the Lions, right? The Lions went out and got throttled by Baltimore. How low are they going to get in Detroit right now, right? The season's over. We're back to being the Lions, whatever it may be. The NFL is a crazy place, man. It's a wild place. Anyone and the, the term any given Sunday or whatever it might be is so true because the margin of error for victory from people who say the Niners are the best team to the Carolina Panthers who are the worst team, it's not like this as far as talent on the roster. It's more like this, right? It's not a huge difference. And so, yes, any team can beat any team on any given Sunday, but the Vikings have to be more consistent across the board on all three phases for me to think that they're a 10 plus win team. I still think this is probably an eight win team, eight, nine win team. I really do. Until they prove to me that they can consistently come out and play like this week in and week out and not have games like they did against the Bears or against Carolina early in the season. And we can show that we've moved past that, right? That is now no longer in our DNA of who we are as a football team. Then yeah, I'll start to jump on the hype train of like, well, let's go see what we can do. But next week is going to be a huge hinge point for this team of can we string together back to back weeks that look like this, or are we just going to continue to ride up and down in the roller coaster in which things go? And still at this moment, I don't have it right in front of me, but they didn't change massively where they rank in points for or points against. They didn't massively change their point differential. The accumulation of this team is an average team now. And the turnovers swung back the other way. So yeah, you fumbled early, but then the last couple of weeks, you're picking up a fumble, running it for a touchdown. You're picking up McCaffrey's fumble. You're picking off Brock Purdy, the turnover gods have giveth and taketh away. Uh, we'll call it even at this point because the ones that the Vikings have gotten have been so huge for them. And yet the overall sample size of seven games statistically is eh, you're a pretty average team that might take you somewhere in the NFC potentially to the playoffs because the teams that you're playing going forward are a lot of them less than average, including the Green Bay Packers that you're playing this week down in Lambeau Field, Atlanta, you got Denver in there. New Orleans is not impressive at all. And I, I feel like Derek Carr is going to set a record for checkdowns against Brian Flores' defense. And, and, and so there's a lot of misery that you've got in this big, wide open space. And, and I guess what I would say is go prove it. Go prove that that's who you are because the opportunity is right there for you. And if they can't be better than what you said, eight, nine, then they are who we thought they were. And that's mm -hmm. just a blip on the radar if that's the high point of the season, then it wasn't good enough if it doesn't carry over and if they don't go on a streak of wins, which of course brings us to the trade deadline. It is never a guarantee to win at Lambeau Field, even if Jordan Love likes to throw the ball to the other team as well. <laughs> and that dude's probably going to freak the hell out against Brian Flores' defenses. That would be my guess. But if you end up at three and five, it doesn't change a whole heck of a lot. As mm -hmm. far as the trade deadline, as far as the sell conversation, they could talk about believing in themselves all they want. They have to win this game, and then that goes away, and then it's a playoff chase, and that's where we're at. Yeah, the narrative completely changes next Monday morning. Right, Next Monday morning, we'll, we'll sit here and we'll say, okay, they're they're back. They're back to what they were last year, probably even better than last year's team in some respects. Jefferson's going to be back in another week or so. Okay, we can see the path in which this is clear to a chance to chase at a playoff hope and a dream here. We lose this game to Green Bay. Three and five, you're fighting a battle uphill and you're really putting, you're not in control of your own destiny anymore. You're really not because you're just too far behind. You're just too far behind to really catch up. And I know the North Division, everyone wants to say, well, it's wide open. But I think Detroit's going to get themselves back on track, and they've got a pretty decent lead, a healthy lead here going into the back half, back half stretch of the season. So this is the turning point, right? The NFL used to have that, what was it, the the show they had on Sunday? It's like the turning point, right? This is this is the turning point for the Minnesota Vikings. And if they come out and have another dominant performance, you know, I think if we squeak a win out in Green Bay, I know it's not easy, right? But that's a team that if we play like we did last night, they beat Green Bay by two touchdowns. They do. Like if they play the style of defense they want, they played last night and the offense clicking and Kirk doing his thing and getting Cam Akers going against a Green Bay team that should, I think they lost. Did they lose to the Broncos or did they beat the Broncos? They, no, they, they lost, lost to the yeah, Broncos. They lost. they lost to the Broncos, right? Like they, they are, they are reeling right now in a lot of different ways. This is, Hey, 
let's go out, continue to get back, and we win this game in dominating fashion, then maybe they aren't who we thought they were. Maybe they have turned a corner and they're a veteran-led team in certain positions and the young guys are all starting to come along and buy in and KOC's got them all rallied together and cool, let's have that conversation. But until then, it's just going to be a big guessing game and we're all just going to have to sit around and play the hurry-up-and-wait game for what Sunday afternoon looks like. What I'm curious is whether we'll be right, having said last week, maybe they should just sell now so they don't upset San Francisco and then believe in themselves too much and then go eight and nine, right? <laughs> yep, like, you know? yep. Yep. <laughs> we could have, we, we, we very easily could have signed our death warrant for the rest of the year with that win, just based off of one win and everyone going, okay, let's pump the brakes. Let's pump the brakes. Get one more win. Let's pump the brakes. And then the wheels fall off, right? Like we could just be playing on borrowed time here and we just won't know, which is the glorious thing about NFL football. Yeah. I have felt like all year I've uh, been talking out of two sides of my mouth, but kind of because they did like when they call it a competitive rebuild, that's doing exactly that. And so it's like when they lose, we hammer them. And when they win, we should praise them for winning because they wanted to be a good team and they said they were going to be a good team. So you should be, but also at the same time, I feel you for every person who watched your Drake may dreams trickling down the drain, knowing what's <laughs> coming up on this schedule. There are trades up people. You can make that happen, but I, I understand where some fans are coming from who watched that game last night and said, great game, love to see a win. But the thing that we're still aiming toward is the, the rebuild part of this. And I still don't think after that game, we're ready to declare them a Super Bowl contender or anything like that. And if you're not going to be like, then once again, you're stuck in the middle with a lot of great players who can't get you there and not a complete enough roster. And so it's hard to be cynical after a victory like that that's so impressive. But I also totally understand the people who are feeling that way this morning. Yeah, and it's a fair thing to feel because this isn't a 5-1 and one football team. It's not. This is, this is still a losing record football team that won a great game. That's what They're a losing football team that won a great game against a good football team. That doesn't change the trajectory in which they were on, in my opinion. They won one week. Congratulations. You almost lost to the Bears last week. We can't just forget about that, right? That can't just pop out of our minds like, well, that game didn't actually happen. Like, this is who we are. This is the NFL. This is the Vikings, right? Look at that. This is who we're always going to be forever and always. It's never going to be any different than what we saw on Monday Night Football. It's not a realistic thing. The players didn't change. They are still who they are. The NFL is a up and down beast. And I think you you look at the teams this week that won. There's a lot of bad teams that won this week. I'm not saying the Vikings are a bad team. But there's a lot of bad teams that found a way to put together a win this week. Does that mean we're ready to declare the Broncos back because they beat the Packers? Like, are we ready to declare the Ravens is the best team in the AFC because they beat the like there's just so many things that go back and forth with the overreactions that can happen still early in the season if this was a win in December and we're now staring at 500 or maybe a game over 500 that's when you can start getting really excited about that but mid-October probably got to pump the brakes a little bit on saying gas pedal this is a this is a real deal football team all right, real quick, uh, love to see it, hate to see it. Do you want to begin? You want me to start? What do you want to do? Go for it. You got it. Uh, Mike Tomlin. I don't know. I have no idea. I, I just want to play for the Steelers for a year and try to figure it out. What does this man do that that team is still a winning football team? Kenny Pickett hasn't played great except for in the fourth quarter. Their defense missing some guys. They get some guys hurt. Doesn't seem to matter. They just keep going over 500 in the playoffs every year. And we talk about coaching every week on the show. This is the value of coaching. And I follow people in Pittsburgh. They complain about this decision or that decision. I think of this with Kevin O'Connell. If you have a top 10 coach, you're just going to win more games because of it. I mean, you're, you're just, you're never going to be out of a season unless you lose your quarterback because you have a good coach. O'Connell's not on Mike Tomlin's level. He's like an all time great. But it's just amazing to see. I just love to see it. I watch from afar and see that man overachieve every single year, and he's doing it again. You know, I hate to see what's happening in Buffalo right now. What, like, what is going on up there? I mean, I think everyone at the beginning of the season kind of had this 
eerie feeling of like, is Buffalo going to be down this year? Is there too many distractions? Is the pressure to win because you paid Josh Allen all this money really high? Have they not been able to reach the Super Bowl and do they miss on their opportunities? Right, There's all these questions swirling. Then they go out and lose to the Jets in week one against Zach Wilson. And then the questions piled on even more. And then they put together a couple good wins and Josh looked right back to being Josh Allen. Like, okay, they're back. They're figuring it out. But now back-to-back losses against the Jaguars and the Patriots bad losses like the Jaguars yeah that's that's a contender team for a playoff spot I don't think they're quite talented enough to make a Super Bowl run yet but that's a talented team but the Patriots have been abysmal I mean abysmal they've been horrible and to go out and lose that game really is going to put a lot of question marks in Orchard Park and you just hate to see a team that has the talent has the quarterback being high paid and just question marks all over the place because they're fun to watch. They're a good time, but I think Orchard Park's not a fun place to be right now. And as a Buffalo guy, I hate to see it. Yeah, I, I hate to see that as well. I wondered about that going into the season because we know this. When you come this close, and they did 13 seconds, and I know it was a couple of years mm-hmm. ago, but when you come this close, it lingers. It just lingers. And then every loss becomes Armageddon. And there, there isn't an attitude of like, oh, we're a good team, bad game, whatever, we'll get back on it. It's, oh my gosh, what is going wrong? Are we melting? Are we, and the, the pressure adds up. Feels a little bit like the Vikings in 2018 when that kind of happened to them. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, my love to see it was uh, the... Um, all the teams, well, I guess you could make this a hate to see it. All the teams who could have traded for Lamar Jackson and were, and were putting out statements. The Atlanta <laughs> Falcons, we will not be trading for Lamar Jackson. Are you serious? <laughs> no. Us? No way. We've got Desmond Ritter, folks. <laughs> we don't need no Lamar. That guy is unreal. It's just unreal. And and he carved up the Lions throwing the football, make it plays outside the pocket. I mean, just a, a, what I don't think they were ever going to trade him. I, I think it was always the plan. They had all the leverage in that situation. But if they were, why did the Atlanta Falcons, et cetera, or the 49ers not trade for Lamar Jackson? Good for you, everyone. Glad, glad all the owners decided to not exactly get together, wink, <laughs> wink, and decide that they were not at all going to con- <laughs> collude against Lamar Jackson. Worked out for John Harbaugh. And they're, uh, I mean, if you're picking a team to, to go to the Super Bowl in the AFC, they got to be in your top two picks. As long as he continues to play and can stay healthy, right? That's the biggest thing with him. Is he? I don't think he's ever finished a full season. I think he's always gotten dinged, and that just comes with the beast of being a running quarterback in the NFL. You're going to get hit by those dudes at one point in time, and it's not going to feel good in a rib, a knee, an elbow, an ankle, I mean, whatever it may be. If he can stay healthy, they're absolutely contenders. 100% they are contenders. Um, Yeah, love to see that too. My love to see it is USC getting beat again by Utah. Utah just being the USC thorn in their side just oh Caleb Williams the Heisman quarterback and then you got you got the Utah head coach going they got a Heisman candidate for quarterback we got a pig farmer right like just phenomenal I watched that entire game every snap just loved every second of it and then just the cowardice of Lincoln Riley and not allowing players to come out to the media what, what is that? Like, these are grown men. They're making millions. And you can say this now. These players are getting paid to play, especially your number one draft pick quarterback who's going to never be able to hide to the media when you go into the NFL. You're not setting him up for success in that regard and saying, nope, no media availability for my players. Coward. Coward. First of all, one of the reasons I like Utah is that the players are as old as I am, and that's fun. Uh, <laughs> they all have uh, three kids and uh, mortgages and everything. Families at home. <laughs> yeah. No, they're they they're one of the toughest football teams every year, and I and I like that. There were a few things about what you said. That Caleb Williams at the end of that game, and I like his talent as much as anybody else. But they show him over and over again, just sitting on the bench, looking toward the sky, head in his hands. I was never more impressed with CJ Stroud than when he lost to Michigan. He talked to the media. And by the way, I tweeted about this 
Caleb Williams wants to talk to the media. He's probably talking to the media. I'm just saying he's the whole, he's the whole university. Mm -hmm. He could make that decision probably just as much as his coach. And he decided to hide away as well. And, uh, his, his reaction I thought was embarrassing after that loss. He did not go congratulate the other quarterback, shake his hand, or right? And maybe college football is a little bit different, but you're supposed to be the guy, which means when you lose the bad game, that you walk off the field as the leader, not flop yourself on the side of the bench. You can let anybody else do that. But some of the stuff with Caleb Williams and, and I'm look, I'm not whatever. He's a college kid. I get it, but you're supposed to be that leader. And there've been multiple times that I have not felt like I've seen that. And there should be some concern about how long he holds onto the ball that he's constantly putting himself under pressure. And now I see everybody else getting blamed. Well, you know, his offensive line. Well, you know, his receivers. Well, maybe Lincoln Riley's not dialing up the right plays. Well, it's on you to, to, you're supposed to be the generational prospect. And I think there's more questions I have about him than I had about any of the other guys that are dubbed generational prospects like Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning, because you saw the leadership element. And I, uh, I wonder about him being soft, like in, in dealing with losing because in the NFL, you lose all the time. Like, even if you're good, you still lose like five, six times a year. Even if you're a Super Bowl contending team, are you going to do that every time you lose in the NFL? It's not going to go well. Um, so I will be very curious to see kind of how that how that develops there. But you're right. Totally embarrassing. Not bringing out those players. And there needs to be, I think, all the people who pay them, all the people who pay to be there and everything else deserve to understand what happened when you get upset like that. But uh, I guess they're too good for that. So anyway, Jeremiah, great stuff. And quick, can uh, I do one more, one more. Oh, hate to oh see sure. It, one absolutely. Quick one. Oh yeah. One more. Go ahead. What the hell was Arthur Smith doing with B. John Robinson? What, 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 like, what, what was that? Like, I don't have him on my fantasy team. Listen, if I did, I'd be irate, but like, you can't not disclose like, well, he just wasn't feeling himself. Like, no, no, no that's not how this works. You, you don't get to just be like, well, he, stubbed his eyelash right like you have to have a reason to not play a guy and I feel like it's still kind of the smoke and mirrors and maybe we'll find out today or tomorrow what thing but it's just a kind of smoke and mirrors thing of well we just didn't play him like that's you can't do that like you you just can't do that now, Arthur Smith it, it seemed like the game is a little too big for him as a head coach really all the whole time he's been a head coach including just not trading for Lamar Jackson uh maybe that's not his decision but uh, with B. John Robinson, I would just like to remind everyone that two teams told us their running backs were different and let Jordan Addison slide down the board. This is why we talk about it every year. Don't draft your running backs because they won't change a franchise. No, no, no. This guy's different. Have you seen his tape? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen uh, Trent Richardson's tape as well. I've seen all sorts. Saquon Barkley. Boy, he was different. I mean, yeah, good player. And what difference does it make? Don't draft running backs the first round. You'll pay for it. Oh, Quentin, you know, uh, or uh, what's his name? Uh, Zay Flowers. He's too, Zay Flowers. he's too short. Jordan Addison, he's too skinny. He drives too fast. Oh, and they didn't know that then. Uh, and uh, we're going to draft a running back. Can you imagine the Lions if they had Addison? If they had Zay Flowers or the Falcons? That's why we say it. Hate to see it. Yep. <laughs> Anyway, well, great stuff. We'll be doing this again uh, after the game against the Packers, and we'll know whether we're talking about this team and a hot playoff race or a massive disappointment in which they should still trade players. That's all. Thanks for uh, your time, Jeremiah, and thanks, everyone, for listening. As always, we'll catch you next time. Sounds good.